Good evening, everybody. Wow, this is so awesome. It's such a wonderful, wonderful group of folks here. Thank you so much for being here. I would like to welcome you to the sixth annual Maine History Maker Celebration. And this year, we're honoring the amazing Hildreth family. But before we get into the really fun genealogy and all that, I hope you've enjoyed looking at your program. We have a very, very, very special treat other than the fact that I think I'm just going to go with these guys for the rest of the night. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, you may be aware that the Hildreth family has a very long-standing uh, Bowdoin connection. Uh, and so, and Charles and Horace both graduated from Bowdoin, as I believe there are a number of uh, their descendants who are polar bears as well. So without further ado, I am so pleased to introduce to you tonight the Bowdoin College Longfellows, uh, an a cappella group that's on campus. And they are going to entertain us tonight with a few songs to get this event started. So gentlemen, take it away.
that bench should start like that. That's, that's just really special. Wow, okay. I want to get started with our evening, our fun evening activities. And I want to just remind folks to, if you would, if you haven't already, to silence your cell phones or turn them off. And also let you know we are looking for a black LG cell phone that seems to have been misplaced. If anybody has seen that, um, can let somebody know or leave it at the front desk. So we'll keep working on that. Uh, so, on behalf of the trustees, uh, my name is Meredith Strang Burgess, and I'm a member of the board. And I am so pleased to welcome all of you to our sixth annual Maine History Maker Celebration. This annual event honors and contemporary Mainers who have made contributions to our community and our state. The award honors traditions of innovation, leadership, and the commitment to community. Those are the core characteristics and values that really have defined Maine throughout its history. The Maine Historical Society created the Maine His History Maker Award in 2013 to illustrate this continuity that we see between Maine's past, our present, and most importantly, our future. In particular, we like to illustrate the fact that we are all, all of us, are stewards of Maine and the actions that each and every single one of us and you take really matter. Past recipients include Merck Henry, Vin Verenu, the Mills family, Barry, Mary Botano, the Chinquette family, and last year we honored Maine's food pioneers. We have several of our past nominees and honorees in the room, uh, and I would like to sort of start with the Mills family and presenting our, uh, our, we have two Millses here, and our first one is our, our governor. Uh, governor Janet Mills is, uh, is here, unless she has had to scoot. We have a couple events going on in Portland uh, tonight, and people are doing their very best to uh, juggle those, and we really, really appreciate it. But Peter, I know Peter's here. Peter Mills is here, and we had such a fun time with the whole Mills family just a few years ago. Uh, we also have Michael Chinquette, and Michael is down front here. You're going to be hearing from him a little later. And the Chinquette family is also another amazing Maine family that uh, we had a lot of fun tracing genealogy and, and talking uh, some fun things through the evening. And finally, uh, Vin Verano, I know you're here as well. Thank you, Vin. Um, your family and yourself have made huge contributions. So we're very, very pleased to have you here with us tonight. And there are a few other sort of um, well-known, important folks who are here with us uh, that many of you had a chance to chat uh, earlier in the lobby, which was really great. But I want to recognize our very own uh, United States Senator Angus King and his wife, Mary Norman. <laughs> and you're going to be hearing from Angus a little later in this evening. And I also want to give a warm welcome to our US, US Representative Shelley Pinkrey. And Shelley. <laughs> right, and thank you guys both. I, I can uh, I have, a, have a interesting schedules that you all have to, to work with, and we really, really, really appreciate it. So Maine Historical Society has truly enjoyed researching and learning so many interesting things about the Heldreth family. Uh, and many of them are here tonight. It's actually really pretty amazing. And I would just like at this point, all the members of the Hildreth family in the bigger sense of the word, just give a wave, if you can, to, to folks who seem to all have an idea. Look at that. Thank you. It's pretty special. Thank you guys all. I know everybody's also very, very busy, and uh, we really appreciate it so much that you took the time to be here because we're pretty um, excited about um, honoring you all tonight. And I would just like to do a special call out to my buddy, Dodie, because uh, I joined, uh, found out about Maine Historical sometime in the late 80s or so. I was uh, doing some research, ended up stumbling into this organization um, and immediately got brought in uh, to do that and worked with them as we bought uh, 489 Congress Street. 
And Dodie was on the board, and I uh, was just en enamored with her. Uh, and in the year that you were president of the board, which I believe was 1995, um, I, you asked me to join the board, uh, and I joined uh, the board at that time. And I have to tell you, I thought, so this is an organization that has a ton of money and connections and all of that. This is going to be the best board ever. <laughs> and I found out pretty darn quick that, in fact, there had been really not a lot of really organized fundraising ever done in all of the history. And we were founded in 1822. So our Madam President, Doe Detmer, uh, rolled up her sleeves along with another gentleman on our board at that time, Stan Bennett from Oakhurst Dairy. And I have to tell you, for the next two or three years, I had the pure pleasure of watching these two operate. And boy, did they operate. Uh, they uh, worked everybody in, I think, all of the state of Maine, but certainly in southern Maine. And it was always every day there was the, the Stan Bennett and Doty Detmer boat trip all summer long where people were taken out and wined and dined and told all the wonderful things. And by gosh, we had the most amazing capital campaign. And Doni, if it wasn't for you, I don't know that any of us would be here because it really, really got us started. And um, amazing things have been accomplished thanks to you. So before we launch into our program tonight, I really just want to quickly announce and thank our sponsors. We could not do all this without them. Their generosity and enthusiasm have been very remarkable. First, very special thanks to Diversified Communications, who is our lead sponsor tonight. We thank you all so much. Diversified, of course, is uh, a little well connected to this story, but still we very much appreciate it. I also want to thank the Island Institute, Spinnaker Trust, Baker Newman and Noyes, Jensen Baird Gardner and Henry, Pierce Atwood, Beryl Dana, and ProSearch. Thank you all very much. And now, I would like to introduce to you a gentleman who I happen to also very much admire. Uh, and convinced me <laughs> to join the board again. Uh, yet, you know, 20 years later, I, I'm back on the board. Uh, and that's our very, very skilled and very smart executive director, Steve Bromage. So Steve, take it over. Thank you, Meredith. I too want to welcome everybody and tell you how much we appreciate having you here. Uh, I think this is one of our favorite events of the year because it really illustrates what our mission and what our work is about. And that's quite simply put, preserving and sharing Maine's story. Uh, the stories that we collect don't just reflect Maine's past, they provide guidance, inspiration, and real examples of what it means to be a Mainer and what it takes to build strong Maine communities. I think the Hilter story you're going to hear tonight really illustrates that. Uh, the proceeds from tonight's program will support Maine Historical uh, statewide celebration of Maine's bicentennial in 2020, next year, coming up on us quickly. Um, there's a lot of great activities uh, planned around the state. Our efforts include, well underway include our current exhibition, Holding Up the Sky, which explores 13,000 years of Wabanaki history. Uh, we have a new exhibit, Exploring Statehood, that will open in March. And we'll be continuing to work with our 270 local partners around the state on our Maine Memory Network to really gather and collect and share stories about what makes Maine, Maine. So thank you very much for supporting that. So the, my function, what we're going to do now is give you an overview of the Hildra story. It's a big, sprawling story, and we don't have a lot of time, so it's going to move quickly. Um, I think many of you have relationships and know the family well or some dimension of them, so we want to put it in the bigger picture and context. Um, the ward, as we talk about the Hildreth family, honors the direct descendants of twin brothers Charles and Governor Horace Hildreth, um, Bowdoin graduates who overlook the, the Bowdoin singers here. The, the story we explore tonight spans more than 100 years of Maine history. It's a period that has seen constant change and evolution, which is a really important theme in the Hildreth story. 
Each generation of the family has found opportunities in the changes that Maine has gone through. They've built and adapted businesses, attacked problems and issues head on, and made Maine a better place. We can tell this story for two reasons. In 1992, the Hildreth family donated the records of Governor Hildreth to MHS. It's an incredible collection of photographs, scrapbooks, diaries, and other material. The collection is really an amazing resource. I also want to thank the mem many members of the families uh, of the family for sharing their personal photographs uh, and to Emory Waterhouse and Diversified. Uh, the images of, that you're about to see are really fantastic. And the hardest part is there's equal many that are just as good that are on the cutting room floor. So come look at my laptop sometime. <laughs> so with that, I want to start by introducing you. <laughs> I'm sure my gang, there we go. I so I want to start by intro introducing you to the cast of characters. To help, we have created um, a genealogical cheat sheet. This is our roadmap. We'll keep going back to it. You have a copy of it in your program to keep you oriented on everybody who we're talking about here. So our story starts in Gardner in 1902. Twins Horace and Charles Hildreth were born to Guy Hildreth and Florence Lawrence. Gardner was a busy industrial city on the Kennebec at the end of the 19th century, though one in economic transition. Its lumber mills were declining, but paper mills and shoe factories remained. Gardner was a worldly place with a literary identity, thanks to famed local writers Laura E. Richard and Edward Arlington Robinson. Guy was a local lawyer and elected to serve as Kennebec County Attorney. He died in 1910 when the twins were eight. Several years later, Florence remarried to a local doctor, doctor who had two sons of her own. Now, by all accounts, the twins were full of moxie from the outset. <laughs> Funny, mischievous, and incredibly close. They were athletes and leaders at Gardner High School. One of the gems we found in the Hildreth collection at MHS was this handwritten poem from author Laura E. Richards, who knew them from growing up in Gardner. Here's what she wrote. Your father and your uncle, two darling boys were they. And whisper, they are much the same and to this very day. The best you can do, in truth, is grow as like and as you can to both. For whether I look east or west, never can I tell which I like the best. <laughs> In 1921, Charles and Horace entered Bowdoin College. By all accounts, they took the campus by storm. They were football stars. Charles is left end, Horace is right end, but nobody was really sure. <laughs> Leaders in every bit is mischievous. This cartoon in the headlines captured it, which is which, and it really, nobody could figure it out. They thought it was a competitive advantage. One rumor has it that they set the record for the individual one mile run at Bowdoin. One brother started and ran half the race. <laughs> the other snuck in and fresh finished it. Family members will share more of those stories a little later in our program. Horace and Charles had an obvious zest for adventure in life, something that continued throughout their lives and that was imbued in their families. While at Bowdoin, they spent a summer as rangers at Yellowstone. After graduating, they shipped out on a Scandinavian freighter and set, spent two months at sea, working and carousing. They graduated together from Harvard Law School in 1928 and both began their professional lives in Boston. Soon, both were married, living in Maine and starting the families that we honor tonight. Charles married Deborah Wyman, daughter of the founder of Central Maine Power Company. Horace married Catherine Wing, a daughter of the head of the Bank of Boston. The twins spent much of the 30s building their families and getting established. They remained incredibly close, talking every day. Charles had five children, Alice, Charles, Jun Charles Jr., Florence, Mary, and Margaret. Horace had four children, Dodie, Hottie, Anne, and Catherine. By the late 1930s, both of their futures were beginning to take shape. Charles had found work helping to dissolve the assets of Fidelity Trust Company, which had failed and held the debt of Emory Waterhouse, a hardware company that was one of Portland's oldest businesses at that time. Emory Waterhouse had been founded in 1842 and provided the tools and materials that rebuilt Portland after the Great Fire of 1866 and supported the city's late 19th century building boom. 
By the late, eight, by the late 1930s, though, Emory Waterhouse's future was in debt. Charles didn't want to practice law and was committing to finding a way to stay in Maine. So, with the help and financial backing of his brother, he purchased the company in 1937. He spent the next 30 years turning it into a strong, modern business. At the same time, Horace was beginning to focus on a political career. In 1940, he was elected to the main house, in 1942 to the main senate, and by 1944, he was ready to make a run for governor. Charles was a key counsel for his brother, and their twin antics continued. He grew this mustache so that it's not to confuse people on the campaign trail. <laughs> that story was covered in Life magazine. Horace, a Republican candidate, was elected governor in 1944 and again in 1946. This is the family at his first inauguration. You can see the Hildreth family really beginning to take shape. The twins, their mother, and seven of their nine children. Charles and Horace had arrived as two of Maine's most important civic leaders. Their nine children grew up in this heady environment and steeped in public service, roaming the Blaine House and Emory Waterhouse headquarters, being part of big conversations about Maine, hiking, hunting, fishing, and exploring the state, and learning to work hard, to play hard, and to not take themselves too seriously. Governor Hildreth led Maine at a time of significant, significant transition to the post-war era. That was a this was a challenging moment for Maine. While America, uh, while America emerged from World War II with a booming economy, Maine's economy was still rooted in the 19th century. Maine was beginning to face mill closings and continued out-migration. Schools, hospitals, and infrastructure was were antiquated. Maine needed to close the gap with the rest of the nation. Governor Hildreth believed that Maine should grow its economy from within and not seek outside capital. In his vision, the typical Mainer would tend his own farm, work in a nearby mill, foundry, or factory, cultivate his independence, and save his money. This was the path of opportunity that he saw in Maine. During his tenure as governor, the Maine Turnpike opened and the fire of 1947 ravaged the state. In 1948, the governor took on Margaret Chase Smith in the Republican primary for, for the U.S. Senate and lost. While his time in elected office was finished, Governor Hildreth's career was just getting started. In 1949, he purchased community broadcasting services, including WABI Radio. In 1953, he created WABI-TV, the first television station in Maine. In 1953, he was named president of Bucknell University. In 1957, he was named ambassador to Pakistan by President Eisenhower. This was a fascinating moment in geopolitics. It was the outset of the Cold War, and Pakistan was a newly independent country. Watch this elephant. It's going to return to our story. <laughs> Through all of this, Charles and Horace's families were growing up. The twins' families were as intertwined as the brothers. Their children lined up by age and gender, and they were together constantly. They spent time at camps on Cobbesee and in Northport, making trips out west into Europe, at holidays, visiting their grandmother and gardener. This next generation, who I'll refer to tonight as the Hildreth Nine, was ready to emerge. Charles Jr. and Hottie attended Deerfield and Bowdoin together. At Deerfield, the boys and their fathers heard a presentation by polar explorer Donald McMillan. Smitten, the boys signed up for a journey to Newfoundland with Macmillan on the Bowdoin. They went back several summers and first connected with two of their future brother-in-laws on board. As the Hildreth Nine matured, they carried many of their parents' values and characteristics, and Maine continued to change and evolve. In 1965, Charles Jr. took over as president of Emory Waterhouse. His sisters, known as the aunties, served on the family-owned business's board. His father had saved Emory Waterhouse, Charlie Jr turned it into a major regional wholesaler and was recognized nationally as a leader in the industry. He oversaw a period of expansion, modernization, success, and constant challenge as the industry changed and consolidated. From an era of locally owned stores and strong regional players to one dominated by national powerhouses like Home Depot and Long Lowe's. By the time Emory Waterhouse was sold to Ace Hardware in 2014, the company employed 300 people and supplied more than 1,100 hardware paint and home improvement stores. 
By 1966, the year that Hadi entered the Maine legislature, Maine was facing another major challenge, the deterioration of the environment. The cumulative impact of the extraction of natural resources, water and air pollution, and unchecked development had taken a major toll on Maine's landscape. But a true envi environmental consciousness was beginning to emerge. Mainers recognized that the woods, rivers, lakes, beaches, and oceans, so essential to Maine's identity, sense of place, and economic future, were under siege. In 1966, a landmark exhibition, As Maine Goes, that featured photographs by John McKee illustrating the condition of Maine's environment was mounted at the Bowdoin Museum of Art. That ex exhibition helped mobilize leaders and others concerned about the environment. Hadi had begun his professional career as an attorney at Pierce Atwood lobbying on behalf of paper companies. That gave him insight into how things worked in Augusta and helped him clarify his own priorities. After one term in the legislature, Hadi spent the next decade quarterbacking the effort to establish, his main, to establish Maine's initial environmental legislation. He crafted or helped shape environmental regulation that still impacts the state, including an early draft of the legislation creating the Land Use Planning Commission and the Site Location Law. He also fought the development of major oil refineries on the main coast, which was seen as a big economic opportunity, potentially. Many of his partners in creating that legislation are here in the room with us tonight. So um, I think uh, Hadi and the family would acknowledge that all of this is a team effort. So thank you to all for coming. In 1979, Hadi became chair of the board of Diversified. He led the company through a remarkable transition from a traditional broadcast company to the international event company Diversified has become. As Emory Waterhouse and Diversified grew and became major players, Charlie and Hadi shared a similar leadership philosophy. Both took pride in hiring good people and then getting out of the way. Hadi's continued advocacy for the environment has been channeled through his leadership on the boards of key Maine nonprofits. He has helped the Island Institute, Natural Resource Council of Maine, Maine Audubon, Maine League of Conservation Voters, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, and the Conservation Law Foundation all become powerful, vigilant, effective protector of Maine's environment. Climate change notwithstanding, the remarkable vitality of Maine's woods and waters today are a function of Hadi's leadership. Thank you. Now I recognize this has been a, ma a male heavy story to this point. I'm hoping to balance that a little bit now. So just like their brothers, the twins' daughters were shaping their communities. Cousins Dodie and Alice, Horace and Charles Firstborn were both born in 1930. When they graduated from college, professional opportunities for women were still very limited. And yet, as everybody here knows, women were as smart, strong, and powerful as the men we've been talking about. Through teaching, service on nonprofit boards, activism, and strong family leadership, generations of women in Maine in the second half of the 20th century shaped the Maine we know today in profound ways. This was the case of the Hildreth women. Alice Hildreth has shared Hadi's focus on the environment. She started her environmental activism locally. In the 1970s, Cape Elizabeth was growing quickly and there was little zoning. She joined the planning board and helped draft ordinance designed to protect wetlands and the rural character of the town. Then, Alice helped transform Maid Andabon from being a, a bird organization into a serious environmental advocate in Maine. She helped lead the effort to establish and develop Audubon's program at Gislin Farms. She was appointed to the Board of Land for Maine's Future, through which she partnered with Sherry Huber and Peggy and Richard Rockefeller on conservation efforts in key Maine spots, including the Bold Coast and Mount Kineo. She then partnered with Mert Henry and Rachel Armstrong to create Piper Shores, that required significant legal changes to create a new kind of environment, uh, retirement community. I now want to focus on someone who, as Meredith has said, is very dear to and has a profound impact on Maine Historical Society. As I said, Dodie was the first child born. After growing up in the Belaine House, she started college at Vassar and then transferred to Bucknell and graduated from, from Bucknell where she studied history. With her family, she then set out on the adventure of a lifetime, moving to Pakistan with her family. She worked in refugee camps and experienced the optimism surrounding the birth of this new country. She met and fell in love with her first husband, the son of the president of Pakistan, 
and remained there for four years after her family had returned to the States. When Dodie returned to Maine, she went to graduate school at Tufts and began a 30-year career teaching history at Wayne Fleet. Dodie has served on numerous boards, including the University of New England and Greater Portland Landmarks, which led her to writing a book on the history of Portland. Dodie joined the Maine Historical Society born in 1918 and became chair in 1996. She then served a second full term, so don't feel bad, Meredith. <laughs> this was a period of profound transformation for MHS from an, uh, a closed internal looking organization to one that's much more outward looking. The board purchased our museum building, restored the Longfellow House, and renovated and expanded the library. This culminated in the creation of the Horace A. Hildreth Archival Center at MHS's Brown Library, which is where all of our collections are cared for. Dodie, MHS today stands on your shoulders. Thank you very much. Three Hildreth women have received UNE's prestigious Deborah Morton Award, Catherine, the governor's wife, Alice, and Dodie. Ann Russell raised her family in Lincoln, Mass, and moved back to Maine in 2007. She has dedicated herself to education, teaching elementary school in Lincoln, ESL in inner city Boston, and working with immigrant communities in Portland. Ann continues to work as a volunteer at Portland Adult Education. She attributes her sense of giving back to growing up with her father's work as a public servant. Catherine Pierce, also known as Dassey, graduated from Wellesley. After marrying, she had six children in the first 10 years of their marriage. Dassey's family had the Hildreth sense of adventure. When her kids were young, they moved from the physical and social comforts of Greater Portland to then new, rural New Gloucester, Maine, where they created a life for their children on a working farm. Then the adventure moved west, where they moved to a remote ranch in Montana, where they spent the next 30 years. She now has 18 grandchildren and is back in Maine. Florence, also known as Floppy and her husband, Ian raised their kids in California and now live in Cumberland Foresight. Uh, there's another elephant, and that is Daniel on the elephant, so I'll just point that out. Ian, one of the young men we saw on the boat and earlier, is an accomplished realist painter and has, has had a successful career in museums. Appropriately, he designed the Peary Macmillan Arctic Museum at Bowdoin. Floppy has long time been a connector in the Hildreth family and is the keeper of many of the Hildreth archive stories and photos. We owe many of these to her, so thank you. Mary, also known as Snooky, was a great swimmer, ranked 10th in the country. She set off to be a marine biologist, worked at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and then did research at Harvard Medical School. The doctor she worked with performed the first kidney transplant and received the Nobel Prize. In the family tradition, she's a great musician, an active traveler, and has served on many community boards, including the YMCA. Immediately after getting married in 1964, Margaret, also known as Buttons, and her husband joined the Peace Corps and spent two years in Ecuador, uh, where Buttons taught school. In 1971, they moved to Montana to raise their family in the grand spaces of the West that she had experienced uh, on the, the family visits out there as a child. While not a Hildreth by birth, we also want to recognize Allison Woody, Woolley Hildreth, who has been an incredibly important person to Maine's art community. The twins themselves continued to make mischief, music and mischief into their old age. It was great having the Bowdoin, Bowdoin group because so many of the family stories go back to music and singing. Um, the rumor is, so when the, the gov when the ambassador left Pakistan, he was given an elephant to bring back to the States, which he did, and the rumor has it that the twins' mothers were huge fans of the elephant, so we can get some clarification and elaboration on that. Through all of this, the family has been together, and I'm just going to quickly go through a couple pages of family slides because I think it shares the spirit of connectivity um, amongst the gang over many, many years. <laughs> and we'll find a way to share some of these uh, images with you online. I love the picture in the center, which is a reunion of the crew that was out on the boat. 
and Charlie. <laughs> okay, we now skip forward very briefly to the next generation. The twins' grandchildren are carrying forward their parents' and grandparents' legacy, character, and contributions to Maine. I only had time to give you a brief, selective sense. Hadi's son Daniel has served as chairman of Diversified since 1994. Today, Diversify employs 850 people in seven countries. Likewise, he's carried forward his father's commitment to the environment, serving on boards including Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Haskett, who passed away in 2008, built and captained the Cutter Francis, a fixture on the Portland waterfront, and visible reminder of the family's connection and commitment to the water, to Maine, and to its history. Thomas is a filmmaker and actor. His film Islander was shot here and explored the dynamics of the Maine fishing community. Margaret's three sons, based in Montana, built a low-impact outdoor travel business designed to help people experience the world's special places and environments. They took President Obama on his very first fly fishing trip. <laughs> Pretty cool. Mary's daughter, Jen Grimm, is executive director of the Falmouth Land Trust. Alice's grandson, Ben Algio, is active, involved in Maine government and politics. Peter Rand and his family run Dingley Oysters. Again, it's just a very small selection. The Hildreth family is here, growing, and remains an important part of the Maine fabric. We can't wait to see what this next generation does. Now, uh, before we move on to the next part of the program, I want to share a short video that was produced by Diversified Communications, um, and it's really designed to share what the fa family's values mean to the company. So let me see if I'm smart enough to make this go. Can you do it? Well, I know I have a Oh, I think it's important for people to study history so they know who they are, mm -hmm. where they came from, and also the values that they have. Where did they come from? Mm -hmm. They came from people before them. My grandfather, Horace Hildreth Sr., founded this company, Diversified Communications, and it has been part of our family for three generations now. Uh, my father, my aunt, and my uncle are on the board, and I wanted to ask them what the values are that make Diversified Communications special. When I walk around the corridors at Diversified, I could just sense a uh, feeling that uh, uh, is, is palpable, that people really enjoy being there and working there, having the camaraderie and having the respect of uh, their fellow employees and, and management. And, and uh, it, it's really quite unusual, I think. And it just sort of happened that way. Well, I've served on public boards, and, uh, and that's fine, but it doesn't have the same comfortable, good-humored closeness that you get on a family board. You know, family, to me, is so, so important, and the family company treats everybody, whether they're, they say, blood relatives or not, as family. And, it's, and he, that feeling is paid back both ways. The sense of values is more acute with a family-owned, family-operated company. And uh, we've always been very interested in promoting from within and uh, making sure that people understood our, the, the culture, so to speak. There's no egos. I mean, occasionally a turkey arrives, but they don't last long. <laughs> asking me uh, what my philosophy of uh, running the company was, and, and I said, that, well, it, it's mainly hiring good people and getting out of their way so they can really do what they're hired for. It is a great company, and I must say uh, that so many of those values, I think, transcended down through your father, and uh, thankfully with you. So I think the company is in wonderful hands, and I'd be awfully proud to have anybody work for it. It's done exceedingly well. I think it's just a fabulous example of what an American company can do and be. What do you think Grandpa would think about the company? I think he'd be very pleased. I really do. I think there are a few people as well 
equipped to provide perspective on what the Hildreth family means to Maine is Senator Angus King. Senator King was hired by Hottie in the early 1970s to help lobby for Maine's early environmental legislation. Having himself served two terms as Maine gover governor, he understands what that unique responsibility means and what it's like to raise a family in office. He has served as U.S. Senator for Maine since 2013. Please join me in welcoming Senator Angus King. Well, after the singing and the show, you all want to talk and take a break now, you can. Uh, Hadi, I have a slightly different motto. It's very close, though. My motto is, hire good people and take credit for what they do. <laughs> uh, it's worked for me for about 25 years. Uh, I do want to set something straight in terms of my own history here in Maine. Uh, every now and then somebody says, well, you're from away. Well, yes, technically. Uh, but when my oldest son was born in Skowhegan, and by the way, his name is Angus King. He lives here in Portland. In fact, he introduces himself, if you can believe it, as the Angus King who was born in Maine. Uh, he's sort of a cheeky character. Uh, but when he was born, I went out on the main street in, in, uh, in Skowhegan and ran into a Charles Forbes, who was a farmer for Brighton Plantation. I said, Mr. Forbes, I was so excited. I just had a son born in a Skowhegan hospital. He's a native of Maine. And the old man looked at me down over his glasses and said, well, by gari, just because the cat has her kittens in the oven, don't make them biscuits. <laughs> and I realized, you can't be from Maine even if you're born here. <laughs> but here's what I want to announce tonight. This is not very well known. One of my ancestors was a guy named Gabriel Archer. My sister's name is Ellen Archer King. My mother's name was Ellen Archer Tyser. Archer, Gabriel Archer, was Captain John Smith's first mate. And he came to Maine in 1612 and spent a few weeks here. So I consider myself one of Maine's first ever summer people. Gabriel Archer. Uh, I want to uh, talk a bit about history and then talk about the Hildreth family. Uh, so you're going to have to indulge me for a minute, but I want to talk about history in terms of current events. And by the way, uh, I used to teach at, at Bowdoin, of all places, and the, the, one of the things I taught was that history is condensed experience. We all learn from experience. Your first, you know, our little boy, the first word he learned was hot, and he learned it from touching a light bulb. We all learn from experience, but we can't experience World War I or the Civil War or the Industrial Revolution, but history condenses it and then shares it with us so that we can learn from it, just like touching the light bulb. For example, you may be surprised that on July 30th, 70, 1778, the Continental Congress, this was 10 years before the adoption of the Constitution, the Continental Congress adopted America's first whistleblower statute. <laughs> July 30th, 1778, and the statute reads, in effect, any person or citizen of the government or of the, of the, of the state has an obligation to report any malfeasance or illegal action and it's a duty of a citizen, and particularly of a citizen within the government. It is a whistleblower statute. So this idea that somehow this is some invention of 20th century of politics, it goes back to the very, very beginning of our country. The other piece that goes back quite a long way is the subject of impeachment. And I've spent some time recently trying to learn a bit about impeachment. Impeachment goes back to 1376. Not here, but that was the first adoption of an impeachment statute by the English Parliament, 1376. And it goes entirely through English history, and again a piece of history that I think is relevant. In all three drafts, initial drafts of the United States Constitution at the convention in 1787, in all three drafts was an impeachment clause. 
And the impeachment is part, the impeachment clause is part of the structure of the Constitution. Because the framers of the Constitution, and here you get back into history, were real intense students of two things, history and human nature. And the Constitution itself, I, I do a lecture which I won't bore you with tonight, but the Constitution is designed to divide power. That's what it's all about. And in my demonstration, I didn't bring it tonight, I have a Vegematic. Anybody remember Vegematic? <laughs> I have a Vegematic, I hold up the Vegematic, and I hold up a cucumber. I say, this cucumber is George III. The Vegematic is the US Constitution. You put the cucumber in the, in the Vegematic, push the lever, and it comes out in pieces. It's dividing power, the House, the Senate, the states, the localities, vetoes, overrides, two-thirds votes, all of those things are designed to keep power from being concentrated in the single set of hands. Because if you read the Declaration of Independence, it's all about George III. And the framers of our Constitution were intensely concerned about the danger, not of a bad person being elected president, but of, of concentrated power, whoever the person is. Lord Acton, an 18th, uh, uh, 19th century British philosopher summed up the, the human nature part of it when he said, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That's a very profound observation. The framers understood that and that's why they divided power and put powers in the Congress, powers in the president, and it's also why they put in an impeachment clause. It was a kind of belt and suspenders. It was, what if all of these other things don't work and someone abuses the powers of the office? And by the way, impeachment doesn't only apply to the president, it applies to any federal officer. And there have been 16 or 17 impeachments in our history, mostly of federal judges. But of course, there have been three impeachments of presidents. Now, one of the, the most famous impeachment was of Andrew Johnson in 1867, and Maine played an absolutely crucial role. It's a wonderful lesson in, in history. Andrew Johnson was a Democrat. He was, Lincoln chose him as his running mate. Unfortunately, he bounced Maine's Hannibal Hamlin off the ticket in 1864. And he picked Johnson because he saw the end of the Civil War. Johnson was from a, a border state, Tennessee, and he wanted to have a Democrat, he was a Republican, to try to unify the country at the end of the war. So, unfortunately, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1865. Uh, Andrew Johnson became president, and he was a dreadful president. And he undid a lot of the effort that Lincoln had made to unify the country, and particularly undid uh, essentially the Northern victory in the Civil War because he was very sympathetic to the South. He was an unapologetic un, uh, racist and he was a terrible president. So he was impeached. The, the Republicans controlled the, the, the Congress and the Senate and Johnson was impeached. And the Republicans had a two-thirds majority. They could have easily, just by party unity, uh, uh, expelled him from office. There were six Republican senators who ultimately voted no. One of them was William Pitt Fessenden of Maine. And Fessenden's argument, and by the way, if you, this is a fascinating chapter in John F. Kennedy's book, Profiles in Courage, about those six Republican senators who voted against the impeachment of Andrew Johnson. But Fessenden, Fessenden's argument speaks to me, and it's why I tend to be a conservative on the subject of impeachment. Fessenden said, if a majority in the Congress is able to impeach and remove from office a president of the opposite party who they don't like, if they don't like his or her policies, if they don't like uh, the way they act in the office, we've essentially changed our constitutional system from an elected president and elected Congress to a, a kind of a parliamentary system where the executive has to be the same, in the same party as the, as the legislature. And ultimately, it was that insight that made Fessenden vote against impeachment. And it took enormous courage. There was a torchlight rally here in Portland right before the vote to try to pressure 
Fessenden to vote for impeachment. And one of the interesting side notes of history is the governor of Maine at that time was a guy named Joshua Chamberlain. And Chamberlain was invited as a leading Republican to come to Portland to participate in this rally to put pressure on Fessenden to vote for the impeachment because this was a, I think the word mania probably applies to, to impeach Andrew Johnson. Chamberlain refused to participate because he just didn't think this was appropriate. So impeachment has a rich history and an important one in our country, but it is one that should not be used lightly, or it should not certainly be used because one party in the legislature, in the Congress, doesn't like the policies or the uh, activities of the incumbent, in this case, the President of the United States. It is a, as one of the historians talks about, it is a, a sword that should not be taken from the scabbard lightly. Because you are, if you think about it, 67 votes in the US Senate is essentially canceling out the votes of tens of millions of Americans who voted for that president. So it's something to not be done lightly. Now, what does high crimes and misdemeanors mean? It's a, it's a catch-all term. There was a lot of debate at the convention about what it meant, but at, at heart, and this is what we'll be debating in, in, uh, in, in the Senate, uh, or in the Congress certainly, and perhaps in the Senate, it's about abuse of office. It's about uh, an abuse of office that's not necessarily a crime in the, in the classic sense, but abuse of office, and it's something that we are going to be facing. I consider what's coming our way not a trial in the Senate, but a trial of the Senate. Lincoln in 1862 came to Congress to try to get them to get out of thinking about the Civil War is a sort of typical political thing and bickering, and he was trying to shake them out of that mood. And he ended that speech in December of 1862 by saying, and here's where you come in. Fellow citizens, we cannot escape history. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. The fiery trial in which we pass will light us down in honor or dishonor to the latest generation. And that's fiery trial that we will be facing probably in several months. The Hildreths. It's hard to, it's hard, this is uh, emotional for me because Hadi meant so much to me. Hadi did hire me at, in, the, in the restaurant, I don't know if you know, but there's a restaurant in the basement of the State House affectionately referred to as the Bay of Pigs. <laughs> uh, and Hadi hired me in the Bay of Pigs uh, I, I've tried to remember when it was, I think it was probably January of 1976, to represent a group called CRAC. You missed CRAC. C-R-A-C. It stood for Coastal Resources Action Committee. And it was a coalition of all the environmental groups who at the time had not had, I was there, I believe, their first sort of full-time uh, professional lobbyist. And uh, it was Hadi and Bill Ginn and uh, Chris Herter at the Natural Resources Council, Bill Ginn and uh, Dick Anderson at Audubon, uh, 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 Tad, I can't remember Tad's name, the last name. At the, Tad. Yeah, Tad Dow at, at uh, Conservation Commission. And it was an extraordinary period in Maine history because of the amount of environmental activism. And by the way, I should, again, it's a little bit history, historical note. Almost all the leadership of the environmental movement in Maine during this critical period was Republican. I just point that out. I, I, I don't know when environmental protection became a partisan issue. I think it's when Al Gore invented climate change. Uh, but it was Hottie Hildreth and, and, and uh, uh, Dave Huber, uh, Ken McLeod, Joe Sewell, uh, Harry Richardson, those were the, the, that was the heart of, in the legislature, the environmental movement in Maine. We did a lot of good work. Uh, one of my personal favorites, uh, which I, I don't usually boast, but I'm going to boast, I wrote Maine's billboard law. 
Now, the reason, no, no, no. The reason I can say that with, without shame is it consisted of a, a assistant attorney general and me sitting in a room with Vermont's billboard law, and everywhere it said Vermont, we crossed it out. <laughs> that was the draftsmanship. Uh, but Hadi was always a, 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 an inspiration, and the work that he did on behalf of Maine's environment persists uh, to this day in public lands every, every, in every possible way. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, I remember my father used to use a term, uh, he's a pillar of the community. You don't hear that very much anymore, but the Hildreths have been pillars of the community, male and female. People, a pillar, you know, in that sense, is a post, you know, like, like the post that's holding up the balcony, a post that holds up society, that holds up civilization. And the important thing for us to remember is how fragile civilization is. In the late 90s, one of my sons graduated from college. I wanted to be there to see what $100,000 looked like all in one place at one time. Uh, now it's a lot more. Uh, but uh, Bill Moyers, one of my favorite Americans, spoke that day. And he said something that has absolutely stayed with me uh, to this day. And he was talking about the fragility of civilization and the propensity of human beings to be violent, to settle, uh, to settle disputes uh, through, through violence and, and confrontation. And looking around the world, you know, we, here we are, we're facing wars and, and violence and, and horrible dangerous situations in all corners of the world. And he said, it, I guarantee you'll remember this, he said, civilization is an unnatural act. <laughs> civilization is an unnatural act. And what he meant was, it takes work. It takes people like the Hildreths, who differ and have political opinions, and work hard and have, have conflict, and are trying to do what they think is right by their view of the right, but do it in a civil way, in a way that respects other people, that involves listening. And that's what I think we so much miss this day. We need what I call eloquent listening. We need to listen to one another and try to understand one another. And Hadi, for me personally, and the Hildreth family, as we just saw, no one epitomizes that quality for me better than the Hildreth family. So where are we? We're at a place of not unprecedented division. 1859 was a time of unprecedented division, but serious division. And Abraham Lincoln, you can never go wrong with Lincoln, <laughs> in his first inaugural, was a plea to hold the country together. And he ended that speech with these words. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Although passion may have strained, it cannot break the bonds that we hold. The mystic cords of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every heart and hearthstone in this broad land, will soon swell the chorus of the Union when touched as they surely will be by the better angels of our nature. I hope Lincoln was right. Thank you. this, we'd like to actually present the award. Uh, Charlie and Daniel, will you please join me on stage?
So thank you, Steve. Um, I've, I've always been uh, proud of uh, things that uh, people in my family have done, uh, but uh, it's humbling uh, to see how many other people are, are interested in, in uh, also. Um, I understand, so this is the seventh year of the award, and uh, I thought it was uh, interesting, uh, Meredith, to uh, look over the, over the list that, uh, that you uh, uh, gave of the uh, previous recipients of the award. And uh, um, I, I find that, uh, I think that over time, as this list of, of award recipients grows, uh, it will continue to build a, a rich and com complex history of uh, Maine, the state of Maine and, and of its community. Um, and I, uh, it's, uh, I think that's true. Uh, our family also uh, is uh, contributing to that. When I think about the fields that uh, Horace and Charles Sr. Uh, were in and my parents and my aunts and uncles, uh, I see public service, Maine-based businesses, education, environmental advocacy, art, raising families in Maine. Uh, and it's all part of building a community. Uh, so thank you to the, uh, the board and staff of the Maine Historical Society for building um, Maine's community. Uh, and Senator King, I also want to thank you uh, for your uh, interest, interesting or fascinating and sobering uh, comments about uh, the times we're in and also for your uh, remarks about uh, your experiences with my dad. Uh, I, was, I was a teenager during the days of the uh, Coastal Resources Action Committee. And uh, I do remember a spirit of uh, uh, adventure in the, in the environmental movement um, at the time. It seemed like uh, commitment, uh, com political commitment to environmental protection was growing. And uh, as you say, uh, it didn't matter. It was uh, led by Republicans, and in the subsequent years, it didn't seem to matter so much which party controlled the houses of the legislature, you could still get good things done. Um, and I know that you're spending time in Washington trying to build relationships on both sides of the aisle. Um, I imagine that work can be uh, both gratifying and uh, discouraging, uh, but uh, in these times, uh, the well-being of the country could end up depending on some of those relationships. Uh, so thank you for what you're doing. And uh, with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Steve. So the last part of our program is the best and most fun. Most of you are here because you know Hildreth, and um, so the rest of our evening we're going to spend hearing stories and tales from their, from their mouths. Um, I'm pleased to invite up Michael Chinquette, who, as Meredith said, is a member of our board and has sat up here on the recipient end several years ago with his family. I'd also like to invite uh, Floppy and Ann to join us on stage. charge. <laughs> well, well, thank you, Steve, and, and thank you, everyone, for being here. This is, this is one of the really fun parts of the evening. Uh, for those I don't know, my name is Michael Chiquette. I, I uh, was up here a few years ago as my family was honored, and, and I'll say to the Hilders family, there's probably going to need to be a sacrificial lamb to join the board of the Maine Historical Society, so be thinking about it. Um, but what, for those of you who are not part of the family, what I would ask you to do is take out your cheat sheet, and I'd love for our uh, panelists to introduce themselves and, and tell us where they fit, and then we'll have a, a conversation and hear what really went on in the Hildreth household. I'm Floppy. Holly. And Michael. I'm Daniel, uh, and Steve was kind enough not to mention that my nickname also is Hooker. <laughs> It should be on. It should be on. It should be just fine. 
Well, thank you, and thank you, everyone. So, you know, we'll start. Uh, obviously, so much of this story begins with the uh, with the brothers and the twins, and you know, we're fortunate enough to have uh, fortunate enough tonight to have three people who knew the twins not only as uh, as they were, but as fathers. And you know, with most families, the stories begin with the parents. So, just curious, growing up with these two uh, smiling, Bowden faces looking down on us, how were they as dads? How was it growing up as uh, as a son or a daughter? I guess. <laughs> It was splendid. Uh, it was challenging. Um, it's on. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I. Um, <laughs> uh, it, there's so many things I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, we grew up. We were very lucky. And I'm speaking as a child soldier at the moment. Um, one of the things that uh, I think was a great gift was Daddy loved to sing. So we sang. We sang from the time we were really little kids. We'd go down to the beach and we'd sing all the way down to the beach, Strawberry Fair and all kinds of songs. And on the running boards we'd sing and we'd yell and scream and have a wonderful time. Uh, I think um, and we were five children and it was a lot of work for my parents to uh, see that we turned out all right. And uh, Daddy was gone a lot, so my mother had a big responsibility. But when Daddy was there, we, we played. We played. We were spanked. <laughs> uh, I mean, Charles can tell you about that time. <laughs> uh, the girls uh, were pretty much allowed to torment him in pieces. And uh, if he had so much as touched us, he was sent to the den, and when Daddy got home, I'll help him. It wasn't fair. <laughs> uh, I wasn't, I really apologize. Oh, <laughs> a little late. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and we were encouraged to, to always try things. And uh, I think that it was a, uh, we were very lucky that way. Uh, he always told us, don't be a sheep. Uh, be yourself. Get out there. He was a wonderful leader. Kids in the neighborhood enjoyed him. He would, when it snowed, he'd get the whole neighborhood out and they would build the biggest fort you can imagine uh, and would dig it all out and the kids loved it. And then when they grew up, they would come to him for advice because he was, he loved young people so much and always helped them. Uh, we, he encouraged us with music. He wanted to, when you came home from college, you were grilled. <laughs> he didn't approve of your professors, especially the ones who said, I didn't believe this, Joe McCarthy was bad. Uh, so we had some interesting discussions in the family. Uh, a lot of politics weren't always perfect. Um, but by and large, uh, I, he was really, he was a, I wrote one thing down. Uh, we were encouraged uh, not just to wait a sec, I really, I like this line it's the only one I wrote that I like um, somehow he found time to teach us, question our thoughts and play with us he made us want to do our best he was a good father that's wonderful and Charles you made it out of the den once in a while again. you made it out of the den once in a while I lost my hearing aid. <laughs> I, would, I would just say that we, as all of us felt, we were extraordinarily fortunate to have fathers and mothers with the strength of character, the great humor, um, the sense of adventure, and, uh, and the courage that those folks all provided by example to us. Uh, you know, we've tried to live up to some of us, did not so much, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, the thing I, I, I remember, as Poppy mentions, uh, the singing, and we did. And, uh, my mother played the piano, and every Sunday night we would gather around the piano, my father thought he was a violinist, but he really was a fiddler. <laughs> and, um, but we would sing, and we made an awful lot of noise. 
uh, everywhere we went, in the cars, on the beaches, on the bonfires, but, and, uh, and it was a togetherness thing. And when we, we got together with the Horace Illness, same thing. It, uh, and they knew all the same songs. <laughs> no, they, were, they were just wonderful. They were very, very mischievous. Um, and um, I suppose that gets passed down in the gene pool because, well, never mind. <laughs> anyway, Annie. Hey, oh, was, yeah. And is the same old true in the other household? Oh, uh, well, we were one big family. You're good. One big family, honestly. The Horace Silvers loved the Charles Silvers. We did all kinds of things together, wonderful trips, and just pure fun. Um, my father was uh, a really busy man and a public person, and I think in that sense he was a little less accessible to us, but he made no doubt about it. He loved us dearly, and he would carve out lots of time, private time, quiet time, to have wonderful conversations to learn about us and to expound often about his theories, this and that. And, uh, but he, he, was a, he was an exciting person and he had a huge appetite for life. And I, I just remember, I wrote down all kinds of things, I won't say them because you've been sitting here for too long, but um, uh, I was about nine or eight or nine, and he met somebody on the street, and this lady came up to him and said, hello, Horace. And, um, Horace wanted to introduce his daughter to him, this nice lady, and he did. This is my daughter, Anne, and Anne sort of mumbled and looked down at her feet and said, Aww. and my father didn't say anything at the time, but he, we got home and Daddy sat me down and said, Annie Banani, that was my nickname, Annie Banani, you've got to learn something for the rest of your life. When you meet people, you look them right in the eye and you say, hello, Mrs. So-and-so, how are you? Or, nice to meet you and so forth. But, so he was always instructing us, but always listening sympathetically and constructively to our problems and our he wanted to he wanted to include us in his very exciting orbit, which he had, you know, three different careers. But he uh, embraced us and uh, wanted us to be part of it, and it was a, a wonderful, enriching um, childhood that we had. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, but we did sing too. We loved to sing World War Two, World War One songs. Don't Still sit on it. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're not like the Longfellows. But we, um, I, I just loved singing and World War One song. Don't sit under the apple tree with anybody else but me. Anybody remember that? No, <laughs> of course not. But anyway, we had a wonderful time growing up and we loved our. Daniel, obviously, as, a, as the following generation, has that mischievous and singing and everything else continued with the family? Yeah, the, the, the singing might have been, gotten even worse in our <laughs> generation. Uh, but I, I uh, do remember, uh, especially on the, on the Horace Hildreth side, my grandparents had this place in uh, Northport. And uh, it was kind of like a, a little, uh, it felt to us like a uh, summer camp. Uh, for kids and for the adults also. Uh, and there were 14 grandchildren and there was uh, swimming and boating and hiking and uh, uh, tennis and uh, uh, it, uh, it's just, it was just a uh, fantastic uh, shared experience that we had. It's wonderful. Oh, I have to say one more thing. Um, you saw pictures of elephants on the video, wonderful video. Just working, but anyway, Dassey and my parents went when we were in Pakistan. We um, they went on a uh, it was an elephant roundup, and they rounded up wild elephants and they tamed them. They paired them with a tame elephant, and there were two little orphans that were there in the group of elephants that were captured, and um, they were useless to this enterprise. And so they gave one to my father and one to 
the Shah of Iran. I don't know what happened to that poor soul, <laughs> that poor elephant. But anyway, Ketub Anissa came to Saturday and um, she was just a, about this tall and she just loved to wrap her trunk around her <laughs> She was adorable. And my father just had a wonderful sense of fun and he thought it would be great to take this elephant around to a Republican gathering. <laughs> <laughs> so we would entice Ketub with a big slice of watermelon to get on the truck. <laughs> get on the truck and we'd go off to these different Republican rallies and my father just thought that was the most wonderful thing in the world. <laughs> <laughs> well that's you know that's wonderful and, and certainly the you know the twins, their spirit certainly lives on and, and we've seen some of it tonight and you know we've heard that they had a lot of fun, they they played pranks, uh, and they rarely argued, but I understand floppy, there was one story at Bowden that you might be willing to share. Uh, yeah, it's a famous one for our family. Uh, but first, I want to disabuse you of that idea that uh, they didn't ever fight. <laughs> I, I came across, while I was looking at pictures and things, of a, uh, a letter, or a paper Daddy had written on uh, being a twin. And he begins the first two or three pages with fight at fight after fight with things they did and my poor grandmother was trying to raise these two scruffy kids and one day she told them to go out and uh, paint the screens. She gave them green paint. Paint the screens and uh, that'll keep you out of mischief for a while. Well she went out to check on them and, uh, and they were painting each other. <laughs> <laughs> so they got a horse whipping. They wrestled. They fought. They beat each other up. They broke their glasses. They did everything. Um, and then Daddy writes about this particular story of Bowdoin College. Uh, and they had gone on a ship that summer and met a, a girl from Gardner. And both fell madly in love with her. It was the end of the world for them. They just, there it was. They both loved her. Well, they couldn't both have her. So one night, when they got back to Bowdoin, they locked the door of their room. They roomed together. And uh, they decided, we're going to just fight it out. <laughs> they broke their glasses. And they broke furniture. They gave bloody noses. They did everything. And pretty soon, we were told that it was the president of the college who was called to come break them down. Daddy in this paper had watered it down a little. And there was just somebody who came in and broke the door down. But the result was they were never, ever to room together as long as they were Bowdoin. And I don't know who won. <laughs> <laughs> but um, that was the last fight they ever had. So. They ended on the high note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, well, great. Well, well, well an addendum to that story is that uh, the lady they were both uh, pressing for were, uh, she, uh, she, neither one of them wound up um, successfully selling their wares. And, uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> the result is, I don't think, uh, a matter of the fights, but it, that uh, the, the Schaefer's, uh, we had a lovely place, this was a lady's uh, family, on the shores of the I wasn't uh, tell the family. River, <laughs> Hollow Oak, and, um, and and they were boys, these garden boys were brought, brought to, invited to the garden party. And at that particular time, they happened to have a pet skunk, <laughs> which one of them put in his coat pocket. <laughs> and somewhere in the uh, garden party, they couldn't resist lifting the little baby skunk out of the pocket and putting him on the gong. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I think it was probably the lady's father who <laughs> banished these guys. <laughs> nothing to do with their lack of charm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a great story. And, and well, they obviously both went on to, to very storied and successful careers in a lot of different ways that, that the family certainly continued. And we saw, you know, the wonderful video 
so Daniel, I'd, I'd turn to you. You know, at Maine Historical Society, so much of what we try to do is tell the story of Maine, and so much of that is our economic history, whether it's mills, whether it's timber, whether it's fishing, whether it's commerce. Um, you know, you've, you've been at the helm of diversified communications and, and certainly a changing landscape. How has how's the company evolved over the years, and, and how has kind of that family spirit helped lead that way? Well, so uh, o over the course of its existence, uh, Diversified has been involved in mainly three areas, um, radio and TV broadcasting, uh, local uh, cable systems, and uh, conferences and trade shows. And uh, we were in broadcasting for uh, almost 70 years uh, and uh, cable for almost 25 years. And especially broadcasting was really part of the identity of our company, but the, in both of those industries, uh, both became dominated by very large players, and it became uh, close to impossible for a, a smaller operator like uh, Diversified to uh, continue to operate su successfully. Uh, so we had to go get out of those industries, and uh, it, it may have seemed like a simple decision, but it wasn't easy. Uh, so today, Diversified is uh, almost uh, all um, involved in, in producing conferences and trade shows, along with websites and uh, print publications. Uh, we produce uh, over 200 events a year uh, in uh, North America, uh, Europe, uh, Australia, and Southeast Asia. Uh, we have um, over uh, 500 employees worldwide, and uh, the Kind of amazing thing is that that this whole business today uh, can can be traced back to one tiny uh, commercial fishing publication, Maine called Maine Coast Maine Coast Fisherman, uh, which was first published in 1946. Uh, in the 60s, it was combined with uh, a, a publication called National Fisherman. Uh, that was uh, that became part of a company that uh, a, relative, a relative of ours owned called Journal Publications, which had uh, National Fishermen and also a little uh, commercial fishing trade show called Fish Expo. And uh, then in 1969, that company, uh, Journal Publications, was merged with my uh, um, grandfather's broadcasting properties, and that became uh, Diversified Communications. And we saw that trade shows were a good business. Uh, we and at first we had uh, two commercial fishing shows: one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast. Fish Expo East and Fish Fish Expo West. Um, we had a, 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 a seafood show also, um, and uh, we just kept uh, building and acquiring shows. And today, uh, seafood shows are our largest uh, shows still, but we're in many other industries also. Oh, wonderful, thank you. So we are uh, coming to the close of the evening, so I do have kind of one last question. I'd, I'd love for all of you to share it. Obviously, uh, much of tonight's a family reunion, I think, for the Hilda's family. And as we saw with some of the pictures, there's a whole other generation coming up and probably even more beyond that. So uh, knowing that tonight's being recorded and knowing that uh, tonight the Hilda's family are main history makers, what do you want the Hilda's family to take away? What's the family charge in the years and decades ahead for the state of Maine? Well, I'll, I'll bite. <laughs> uh, I think the bedrock of both Horace and Charles, the twins, was some values that uh, are so solid that I would hope we could all pass them on to the next generations. I'm sure many of you share these. but. The first thing that I think they, they uh, were, uh, uh, integrity was terribly, terribly important to them. You did not, I mean, I did, but I mean, you aren't supposed to lie. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the, second, the second thing they, uh, they, they, they valued highly was loyalty. You had to be loyal to your family, to your friends, to your employees, and uh, that was embedded in them. It was part of their bedrock. The third thing was hard work. You didn't get anything 
without hard work. And, uh, and then finally, I think, family. And family was terribly important. And it wasn't just blood family. It was, as they are in your company and my company, it was the employees. It was, it was the customers. It was the suppliers. You treated people like family. And I guess that goes back to the strength of character which these two guys had and which was, I think, so we were so fortunate to have uh, been exposed to so continuously. Well, I would ditto everything that Charles said, but I would add that I think uh, I would like them, and my parents certainly instilled this in me, be yourself and follow what you feel is important in life. And I look at this younger generation, and they are fantastic. They're involved in, maybe not on a grand level, but on a micro level, as Sarah said, um, the arts, education, women's issues, environment, you name it. And they're, they're doing it, and they're um, doing it because they feel they want to give back. I think they all feel that they have been given a wonderful start in life, and I think they all have this feeling of um, gratitude and a desire to help this beautiful but bu bruised world that we live in. And um, I'm very proud of them, and I think they're gonna do a good job, and I'm very optimistic. <laughs> I can't beat that, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just, uh, I'd just like to leave it on a light note, because that's I'm very light. Um, also, when I was looking through journals and everything, I found that um, my mother wrote beautiful letters all while, well, any time we went away, and I have them all. And Daddy would write, scribbled in at the bottom, some little nugget that he thought I should have, and it was advice. And so when you ask the question about advice, I thought I'd save a few of these. This is a typical kind of advice I got. Be yourself, don't be a sheep, be natural, keep your nose clean, be a good sport, eat your oatmeal, <laughs> work hard, play hard, don't procrastinate. I think that was for me especially. Don't be afraid to try things. Put things back where you found them. <laughs> <laughs> Don't spend your capital. I was older then. Laugh a lot. Think of others. That was it. Wow, well, that's a great note. Thank you. Thank you all.